Welcome back to Curious Archive. This video is the third part of a series exploring the incredible speculative evolution project of Serena, the world of birds. Serena was created by Dylan Beta, a terrific artist and world builder. I have links below where you can follow and support his work. When we left off, Serena was home to a single supercontinent at the end of the Pangea scene. Now it is the Ultima scene, the final era of Serena, and one more incredible than any that came before. At 250 million years post-establishment, the supercontinent has split into northern and southern landmasses. This period will see the rise of multiple forms of highly intelligent life. And in much the same way that elephants, dolphins, crows, and humans, which as far as we know are some of the most intelligent animals ever to exist, all happen to live in an overlapping time period, a similar convergence will occur on Serena during the Ultimacene. On the enormous grassland of the southern continent, many key species can be found, like the successful Serquagodonts, who look almost unrecognizable from their roots as tiny fish 250 million years prior. Giant archangels flock nearby, a type of metamorph bird, a curious classification that will define the early Ultimacene. And scavenging close by, a large bumble badger makes off with a young Serquagodont, foreshadowing a rivalry between the two groups that will change Serena forever. But we're not there yet. Right now, soft-billed birds, the very descendants of ancient water snuffles, are prospering during the Ultimacene. Organisms like the bludge birds are now extinct, but another offshoot of the mittens, the southern squid stork, or squirk, are still going strong. These intelligent creatures are omnivores and use their tentacle beaks to grab hold of hidden worms and mollusks. In temperate forests, another soft-billed bird is the shy and reclusive moo, a horse-sized herbivore that lives perpetually on alert. Why would a creature of this size be so skittish? The truth is, it has good reason to be. Elsewhere in these forests lurk the grappler, predators similar in build to the moo, which are their preferred prey. Their tentacle-like beaks are lined with sharp teeth and tipped with talons, making them deadly apex predators. A different branch of softbills are the teres, a group that includes the hilariously named newts, whose facial tentacles fused over time into one elongated, fleshy mouth. When threatened, these birds are able to scoop up their eggs and carry it against their chins, where a small fold of feathered skin keeps it secure while they flee. A related group are the neckbeards, who, like the newts, have an amusing name and carry their eggs against their chins, although the neckbeards take this to a new extreme by having a more defined pouch to hold their eggs, allowing them to stop brooding on the ground at all. In warmer forests, you can find the Lumber Beasts, the largest living mucks on all of Serena, standing up to 25 feet or 7.6 meters tall and weighing over 2 tons. The group, however, is in the decline, with most now wandering the forest in isolation. In the branches above, however, life flourishes. Here, much-changed tree-dwelling tribbets swing near the bizarre tentacled boros, an offshoot of the soft-billed mittens truly fantastic forms of life. On the subject of fantastic forms, possibly no creatures are more unique than the changelings, or metamorph birds. Although the metamorph group reaches their peak in the early Ultimacene, their ancestry goes all the way back to the Cryocene. The metamorph line began with birds that laid small, shellless eggs, which made the process of reproduction faster, but led to their chicks being born extremely underdeveloped, almost looking like bird tadpoles before they reached adulthood. Over millions of years, this larva-like stage became more viable and more complex, with the tiny young developing stronger forelimbs to move around more efficiently before becoming adults. Other metamorph embryos were laid in the water and became more fish-like, adapting for life in an aquatic environment. Millions of years on, the end result is perhaps the most adaptable and physically diverse vertebrate clade ever to exist. Among their varied ranks are the zebra tweezel, bumblebee-sized birds that begin life as worm-like larvae and are among the smallest birds ever. Another metamorph is the blue-throated boomsinger, one of the largest birds ever to walk the land, which stands up to 50 feet or 15 and a quarter meters tall. Some aquatic metamorphs, like the long-billed pike bird, have even abandoned their adult forms altogether through an extreme expression of neoteny, essentially becoming fish-like organisms. Truly incredible. Other metamorph birds have a somewhat unfortunate lot in life, like the dayflight bird. These extreme metamorphs begin as incredibly fish-like larvae. They then consume themselves in a silken wrapping of their own saliva, which hardens into what is essentially a second egg, within which they metamorphosize into adults. 
Tragically, however, the adults lack mouths altogether. The day flights therefore live only a single day in their adult forms, during which they lay eggs to repeat the cycle. And if this sounds too outside the box to evolve, know that real-world mayfly insects have a very similar life cycle that ends in an adult form that lacks a mouth. Perhaps the most impressive metamorph bird, however, is the storm sonar, a highly migratory archangel with a wingspan of 50 feet, or over 15 meters, the largest flying animals ever to exist. Despite being larger than some airplanes, storm sonars are gentle giants, named for their eerie, echoing calls. As previously stated, aside from the metamorph birds, one of the major themes of the Ultima scene is the development of intelligence among many animal lineages. In the ocean, the herbivorous ring-necked porplets and carnivorous sea strikers are two such examples. Both species are social animals with keen minds. The sea strikers have learned to operate like sheepdogs, systematically herding the porplets to create a consistent food source. Considering how advanced and similar both species are, however, it's an unsettling system, proving nature can be quite cruel. And nothing is quite as cruel as an ending. In the words of the author, as happens to everything in the cosmos, from flowers to stars, Serena itself is now dying. The moon is starting to slowly cool down and it will never warm up again. As stated before, the Ultima scene will be the final era in the saga of Serena. But before the curtain falls on Serena's finale, there may still be time for something truly incredible to occur. Over the past several million years, one branch of the Cerquagodonts has begun an extraordinary transformation. For eons, Cerquagodonts have been unable to feed on tall trees due to their short necks. But now, one species has specialized a body part that will allow them to do so. Not their necks, but their ears. From their hearing structure, some Cerquagodonts have developed antler-like mobile limbs that are able to reach up and hook branches, an adaptation which might one day have intriguing consequences. Before that day comes, however, other branches of the Tributeers are also doing pretty well for themselves, rivaling the birds in diversity several million years after crawling onto land. Take the painted Rapandor, the widest spread Canathir on land in the early Ultimacene, whose jaws have a unique shearing motion that helps them consume prey. Or the Thorngazer, a hairless molodont able to survive off bristly desert plants alone. And in the skies, the branch that became the Tribats is also still going strong. Like the blue-eared Vibroteryx, a nectar-drinking specialist that uses a long brush-tipped tongue to gather food. And in the seas, yet another offshoot is becoming aquatic, like the spotted Snail Smashers, a strange-looking group that feeds on various types of mollusks. Between the metamorph birds and various tributeers, Serena is at an all-time high of biodiversity. But now the moon is truly getting cold. We are now in the middle Ultima scene and a new ice age is setting in. In this new world, only the most adaptable will survive. Sextacorn thorn gazers are one such species, which have become thick-coated ice age herbivores with specialized facial horns that give them a menacing look. Despite appearances, these creatures aren't overly aggressive, just interested in self-defense from Ice Age predators. Another curious-looking new arrival in the Ice Age are mammoth truncos, descendants of the neckbeards that have developed both a longer beak trunk and a truly robust neck pouch to carry their eggs in, which has come in handy in the cooling temperatures. At this point in the Ice Age, the largest archangels are sadly in trouble, as the rapidly cooling world is making their migratory patterns less and less effective. Some archangels are adapting, however, by becoming smaller and less migratory offshoots called seraphs. Examples include the Tundra Tis, which might not be as spectacular as their larger relatives, but are much better adapted for this new world. Closer to the equator, a story unlike any other is now, at last, set to begin. Over the past several million years, a group of Cerquagodonts called the Antlers, which have become more intelligent with more complex antler-like manipulator appendages, find themselves blindsided by a creature that hunts them with an astonishing degree of planning and foresight. 
These carnivorous life forms, the grave diggers, are descendants of the bumble badgers. While other predators evolve sharper teeth or longer claws to catch their prey, the grave digger has developed a bigger brain. They have, incredibly, learned how to make traps by digging deep pits into the earth with their powerful arm claws and using their beaks to sharpen sticks which they place at the bottom. It's a kind of trap that antlers are helpless against. But not for long. By catching the less wary antlers, the grave diggers are inadvertently selecting for smarter and smarter prey. And so the evolutionary arms race is set into motion. It will be perhaps the most rapid of any so far on Serena, as well as the most pivotal. Soon, one particular type of antlier, the standing antlier, will become intelligent enough to avoid traps, and in turn therefore give rise to grave diggers with more effective trapping abilities. In time, the antlers and grave diggers both achieve sapience, able to use basic tools and becoming smart enough to avoid each other. While no longer predator and prey, however, a hatred has risen between both groups that would define the coming era in unexpected ways. The standing antlers have now become the woodcrafters, one-of-a-kind looking social organisms with exceptionally advanced brains and highly expressive faces for communication. Woodcrafters have also developed a whistling language, somewhat similar to the sounds of an elk, and can craft spears to defend against predators, although they themselves are herbivores. Spears aren't the only thing they've learned how to craft, however. As their name implies, woodcrafters have learned to shape the trunks and branches of trees, creating basket-like homes as well as fences, bridges over rivers, and sculptures of beasts or abstract creatures from their lore. For the woodcrafters are developing a culture, one that is in large part defined by a hatred of predators. Meanwhile, the grave diggers are achieving a similar level of brain function. While their marks on this world are subtler than the woodcrafters, often little more than art carved into the sides of trees at the edge of their territory, they are still the marks of high intelligence. However, the grave diggers are learning to be careful when they make these marks, as it can attract unwanted dangers. The woodcrafters, which have at this point driven most predators from their environment on a crusade to make a safer world, are now leaving their territory in search of more predators to slay. Once the prey of the grave diggers, the woodcrafters have turned the tables entirely, and are now killing grave diggers not out of self-defense, but due to a misplaced crusade. Eventually, however, an incredible transformation occurs. As they expand out, woodcrafters begin to encounter barrier trees made by gravediggers who never learn to stop making art out of fear of discovery. At first, the woodcrafters assume these markings are the work of some unfamiliar woodcrafter village. After all, in their limited worldview, they are the only ones intelligent enough to create art. But there are no signs of others like them in this region, only their old enemies. In the words of the author, the woodcrafters had set out to create a world without monsters, and it is only then that they realize that they have become them. With the revelation that they are not alone at their arbitrary pinnacle of life, that the monstrous gravediggers they'd slain for years are intelligent just like they are, shock quickly spreads through the woodcrafter communities. And it is at this time of great cultural uncertainty that the trajectory of the two species shifts forever from a small choice. An orphaned gravedigger infant, left alone after the death of their mother, one of the last gravediggers ever hunted for sport, is taken in by an empathetic woodcrafter warrior-to-be. This gravedigger child, aptly referred to as Bridge, is at first regarded with suspicion by the other woodcrafters. Soon, however, they learn to socialize with the group, displaying a personality and emotional complexity normally hidden from all outsiders. Bridge would forge a path for cooperation between the two most intelligent Intelligent species on Serena. The woodcrafters and the gravediggers, intertwined since their shared beginning, would break a multi-million year cycle of violence between intelligent predator and intelligent prey. In time, other young gravediggers following Bridge's example would abandon their territorial ways and imprint on woodcrafters. And in turn, the woodcrafters would accept the young gravediggers into their society. Eventually, the younger generations would never know a world where antlers and gravediggers were enemies. And whatever the future would hold, the two species 
species would face it together. Perhaps only tragedy awaits all life on Serena as it continues to cool past the point of no return. But it's always been a saga of both the good and the bad, a story of life and death, of extinction and evolution. In any case, for the time being, one thing is for sure. The mud wickets and bumblets sure came a long way. Dylan Beta has released some content set after this period, but I don't want to dive further into the future until the whole project has been unveiled. So it's a story which will have to be told another time. For now, this is the end of our three-part series. If you found this speculative evolution epic as enthralling as I did, please follow and support Dylan Beta and his project using the links below. There's also plenty that I wasn't able to cover in this limited time frame, so if you're curious about learning more of Serena, links to his site are also in the description description. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support, and like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.